Hello everyone, James here, and today I'm going to be painting Howl from Howl's Moving Castle. I have started a little fan art series for December because I kind of wanted to take it easy, um, even though it has not turned out that way. I just wanted to be able to do something that felt really fun, that I didn't have to kind of conceptualise too much. And it's going really well so far. So I've painted Kiki and Howl from Howl's Moving Castle. My patrons have chosen the fandoms and there are a couple more coming up, but I'm going to keep them a surprise. And I'm going to be using Roman small watercolours for today's painting. So before I kind of get into some of the techniques and advice about this painting, I just want to give you a bit of a rundown on my first impressions. First things first, the packaging is beautiful. They come wrapped in watercolour paper and there's a little sort of swatch on the front. So the colour on the outside is really true to what's on the inside. And that was a really nice kind of handmade touch to it. They are hand poured and you can see on the panes grey that it was a little bit messy around the edges. And that was actually just a really nice touch. Although it's messy, it kind of made me feel like a lot of care had been taken over the paints, <laughs> which kind of sounds counterintuitive almost. But um, it felt like I'd bought from like a really small Etsy seller or something. And yeah, it was just quite a special experience opening them up, which was nice. But aside from the packaging, the aesthetics, they felt really familiar. It was like I was painting with my Windsor and Newtons. And that I think was even more special because normally there's a little bit of kind of growing pains for me when I switch paints and I try something new. And these just felt like they were like an old friend almost, <laughs> like I'd never not used them before, which was lovely because I could just kind of get straight to it and start working on my painting and not worry about how they were going to behave. So a little bit about Roman Small, they make a heap of colours. I think they're like 160 now and most of them are single pigments. And that's so that artists can mix their own. It's great for me too, because I don't often buy convenience colours. I think the only one that I actually have in any set of paints is Payne's Grey. And I've actually started mixing that myself nowadays with an ultramarine blue and a black. But if I'm not careful, I'm gonna get off topic. So back to the topic. Lots of single pigments, so you can mix really, really clean colours, which is a really, really nice thing. And yeah, I said they were inexpensive. They were like a couple of pounds for a full pan of paint. Bear in mind that when I buy my Windsor & Newton professional pans, they are a half pan and they cost upwards of like five quid. So they are exceptionally good value. But before I go any further, I noticed that there was loads of yellow coming through in my paints and it's because the top left yellow, the medium Hansa, had stained my brush and you can see these swatches on the paper. That was me after repeated rinsing, really, really, really trying to clean the brush. The colour wasn't coming out and it was affecting the colour of my mixtures. So just be careful of that. I'm not sure what other colours do it, but I only found it a problem with that one. And I've not experienced that with this pigment from other brands. So I was a little bit surprised, but not the end of the world. I'll get the brush cleaner on my brushes. <laughs> the colour. It's incredible. The shift from like when it's wet to when it's dry is minimal. So they stay really bright and vibrant on the page, even when they're dry. I think that's got something to do with the honey in the binder. I know they use other things, but they're not kind of widely reported, but I know that they use honey in the binder. So that definitely will help with brightness once they're dry. But also once the pan is wet, just a tiny little, just the tip of my brush, in the paint pulls out so much pigment, it's kind of unreal. These are gonna last me forever. So not only are they great value for the size of the pan, they're great value for what you get in the pan. I actually can't speak about these paints highly enough. And I'm not surprised that they're so popular for all these reasons. I was just seriously impressed. The only thing that I'd say that I wasn't that impressed with is when I was mixing Ultramarine and Alizarin Crimson. Um, and actually this skin tone that I've been using in this section, the paint kind of splits a little bit and, and quite quickly too in the water. So it settles to the bottom and does need a good mix every time, you know, I put my brush in there. I think that probably has more to do with the fact that it's ultramarine blue and that's granulating. And so we'll settle a bit more. I guess the pigment's heavier, but I'd like to do a couple more tests. So I'm going to buy a few more colors and I will um, report for duty on that point <laughs> in the future um, and let you know if that's kind of a common 
a common characteristic of the paints. The other thing that I didn't quite like was the Payne's Grey. So I'm a huge fan of this colour. Anybody that's been watching my videos or following me on Instagram will know that it's like my number one. And the only reason why I don't like it is nothing to do with Roman Small really. It's, it's mainly just the pigments they chose. So it kind of leans towards green and that's because they're using quite a green, blue and a red in the mixture with a black. So it's a three pigment paint and it's that leaning towards green that I'm not so fond of. But that's okay because I've got tons of other Payne's Greys that I really, really love from, from lots of other companies. And um, I tend to mix my paints together anyway. So, you know, I'll have a cerulean blue from Sennelier. I really love the Windsor colors from Windsor & Newton. So I'm not afraid of like mixing brands together for my perfect palette. But I basically have this massive mixture of paint from loads of different brands that I kind of don't, you know, they're not all from one company. But the colors that I bought from this range, which is the Aquarius range, worked really, really well together. And the ones that I liked the best was the permanent alizarin crimson, which was a little bit more like a quin rose, but was still nice. And mixing it with the French ultramarine gave a really beautiful shadow color. It was really lovely. So not only did the warm primaries work really nicely together, but I really love how that cooler red interacted with them as well when mixed to kind of achieve other colors. And on the note of mixing colours, because I wasn't so keen on Payne's Grey, I tried mixing it with some ultramarine blue, but it just separated a lot in like wash tests. So I have moved for this background, I have moved to Indigo from Windsor & Newton, their professional series. So forgive me, but I also didn't have the right colour. I wish I'd bought an Indigo from Roman Small so I could have kept this video kind of um, cleaner in a sense. So I was kind of only using all of their colours for the video. But I will get some more, like I said, and, and try them out. For this wash, <laughs> it sucks because I'd literally just done a video on Patreon about how to get an even wash and I ignored all of my basic rules about washing. I didn't tilt my board. Um, I moved my brush around too much. I used a stiff brush as well, which didn't help. It kind of left all these marks in the paper, which you can see in the kind of dried version. Um, I don't know what I was doing. So I let it dry fully and then I went over it again, tilted my board at a funny angle, which is why this perspective looks so weird. And I tipped the painting upside down as well because I really hated going around the fingers the right way up because they slant upwards when the painting's the right way around. It's really difficult to get the paint in there and then it pulls when it is in there. So I tipped it upside down so that the fingers kind of follow the direction of the paint. And this was a lot easier actually. Uh, so this board is tipped at about 45 degrees. The paint is very thick. So you need a steeper angle with a dark wash. Um, so yeah, it's at 45 degrees. I'm going very, very gently, just row by row by row. I've split the painting in half so that I don't have to worry about going round the other side. And you'll see what I do with that, with that join later. Um, it becomes part of the falling stars that are dropping to earth around him. So a little cheat there on my part. But unfortunately then, I, I kind of really wasn't happy with the coverage. So I let that dry as well. It was still a little bit patchy. And then I went over it with some Payne's Grey. It was also really blue. So I wanted to knock that blue back a bit. So another quite thick wash of Payne's Grey over the top made it really nice and dark. Still a bit streaky coming up on the camera but um, in real life, it wasn't as streaky as that. I think my camera just picks it up. And then this was the fun part. This is the part that I was kind of looking forward to um, the whole time was putting in the stars. So this is the meeting of Howl and Calcifer. And one of my favorite scenes from the movie, by far, it's just dreamlike and just wonderfully done. And there's so much movement and it's kind of peaceful and hectic at the same time. Maybe that's just my memory doing one on me, but <laughs> yeah, it's possibly visually one of my favorite scenes kind of ever made. And it really lent itself to my style. So I, I wanted to capture that in the way that I paint, which was very exciting for me. These lines that you'll see in a moment that I'm making with the gold leaf, <laughs> they're all done freehand. And I 
I say this quite a lot, but I, I honestly don't think I breathe much. I had to keep reminding myself to breathe <laughs> because I was, you know, bit by bit trying to make these perfect lines running through the painting. And I kind of agonised about the placement of, of the angles of the falling stars. So it was a real challenge, but one that I think paid off. I hope paid off. I hope you think so. I do. Anyway, I'm allowed to say that, I think. <laughs> But yeah, so it was kind of a scary moment, but also really exciting. And so once the brush started kind of scraping away the excess gold foil, I was I was really happy with the result in the end. You'll notice I'm using two different gold colours, and that's not because I ran out of one colour at all. No, <laughs> not one bit. No, it totally is. The yellow or gold is the genuine gold, and I did run out. I tried to be really sparing. I cut all my leaves into quarters, but... Um, it didn't stretch as far as it needed to. Having said that though, it was kind of one of those moments where you're like, okay, yeah, I like this, because the paler gold kind of gives it depth, which is quite nice. So it looks like some of the falling stars are further into the background because they're less vibrant. Oh, and this bit, oh, so, so stupid, so impatient. I think it was like two o'clock in the morning when I was doing this and I didn't wait for the glue to dry clearly. So when I rubbed over one of the little sparks um, coming from the falling star, it just smudged across the whole page. So disappointing, but something that, you know, I might be able to fix one day, just to dry brush it with some paint or something to try and mask it. But, but I thought I'd leave it in because I think it's interesting when things don't quite go to plan. So, yeah. And that is it from me today. That's Howl. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the paints and I also hope you enjoyed seeing me making Howl and bringing him to life. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your support. I love chatting to you guys in the comments so come meet me there and thank you to my patrons. You guys are wonderful and I hope everybody's been having a really wonderful weekend and I'm going to speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.